thank you all for coming up tonight, uh, taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to help us on Red Wing 2040, our planning process for the next 20 years here in Red Wing. It's vital that we get folks like you to show up and work with us on thinking uh, about where we're going to go in the next 20 years or so. Uh, this is the third of our Innovative Ideas series. There's been two before uh, in the last several weeks. And we've been uh, privileged to share in really cool new ideas from other communities, other folks uh, that we can take or consider uh, building into our plans going forward. Tonight, we're covering one of the most important subjects, I think, as housing and redevelopment in Red Wing. We do have a bit of a housing issue here in Red Wing. And so anything that, uh, any ideas that can come forward to help us on our task going forward for housing and redevelopment will be really welcome. And I, everybody's ideas are welcome in this process, so there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to contribute in this process. So thank you again for coming tonight. And I'll, let's get started. And I want to introduce uh, the leader of tonight's uh, session, Bruce Chamberlain, founding principal of LOAM. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Thanks for being here. Um, ooh, that's loud, isn't it? Okay. It's nice to see you all. Um, I've had the privilege to work in Red Wing oh, on projects um, almost continuously, but not quite for the last 20 years, um, which has really been fantastic. I happen to uh, grow up upriver a bit in Hastings. I live in Minneapolis now and have been involved through my career in um, many redevelopment efforts, park efforts, a lot of community um, uh, initiatives focused on the kinds of things that Red Wing is interested in doing and Red Wing is interested in establishing with their community. So it's great to be here. I'm going to help moderate tonight's uh, discussion and I'm going to introduce our speakers first. And I think what I'll do is introduce everyone in the order that they'll speak. Um, and then I'm going to uh, manage the slides as folks are talking to. And I have a few slides just to help kind of set a framework for the kind of discussion that we're going to have. So I'm going to uh, go through and talk about the folks who are here. Rusty Fifield is the Managing Director and Municipal Strategist with Northland Public Finance. Rusty has helped public and private clients solve critical financial and community development issues since 1979. His unique background includes professional experience as an independent financial advisor, a planning consultant, and a city manager. This breadth of experience provides Northland's clients with valuable guidance on planning for, uh, planning for and implementing development and capital improvement projects. His technical abilities are complemented by group process skills that help clients understand complex issues and reach agreement to take action. Rusty will be our first speaker tonight. Tom Ostoba, founder of Tau Strategies. Tom's history of leadership and innovation spans public, private, and nonprofit and academic sectors. He has served as a highly regarded policy expert, leading practitioners of sustainable development projects and programs, uh, thought leader and innovator. He's a thought leader and innovator in urban sustainability and economic development, and creative entrepreneur and innovator at the leading edge of social enterprise and sustainable finance. Sean Walther, to my left, is the planning and zoning supervisor with the city of St. Louis Park. Sean Walther has 20 years of experience uh, in redevelopment and plan implementation, which is where community goals and policies intersect with current neighborhood, site, and market conditions. He's enjoyed serving the city of St. Louis Park for the past 12 years. Sean also worked for the cities of Anoka and Ramsey and interned with the Minnesota Office of Environmental Assistance and Initiative Foundation in Little Falls. Sean has a bachelor's degree in local and urban affairs from St. Cloud State, and he studied urban and regional planning at the University of Minnesota Humphrey Institute. Bill Beard, who was running late, and I just heard my pocket buzz, and I'm guessing it's Bill. Uh, he'll be here shortly. Bill is the president and CEO of the Beard Group. Uh, Bill chartered the Beard Group in 1990 and is currently its president and CEO. The Beard Group is a full-service real estate development company specializing in redevelopment and mixed-use projects. 
The Beard Group is rooted in the, in the belief that selecting a partner in redevelopment can be a daunting task. The Beard Group is built on three foundational values, community, creativity, and integrity. Sounds like Red Wing to me. These values guide their every effort in doing well by clients while assuring every client, partner, and customer a professional and principled experience. So those are our panelists this evening. I'm going to run through just a few slides. And the whole idea was to look at downtown and understand what the things were that would drive downtown Red Wing uh, specifically into the future. And I think this is a, a good basis just for, as, as a refresher really, in the topic that we're discussing this evening around redevelopment. Um, because so much of what we're seeing with communities focused on from a redevelopment standpoint have to do either with their downtown core or their commercial districts that are becoming more mixed use over time. So I think the, the action plan provides that kind of, of basis. We look at all of the different uh, districts of downtown, especially as they relate to the river and the core of downtown, to understand what kinds of attributes they all have and the kinds of things they bring to the community and could really be leveraged for looking at redevelopment efforts as the community goes forward. Um, as we were establishing the Downtown Action Plan, we, we developed a, a moniker or a, a tagline that essentially suggests establishing Downtown Red Wing as a premier historic river town by creating vibrant <laughs> gathering places, attractive housing options, thriving commerce, and strong connections that celebrate the experience and foster sustainability. So the notion is that there is no silver bullet to the kinds of things that Red, Red Wing wants to accomplish in the future. And there's no silver bullet to um, incorporating investment and reinvestment into the community. So we need to be looking at all of these things comprehensively in order to establish the kind of framework, the kind of amenity package, and uh, the interest for uh, reinvestment in the community. We, so we uh, looked at strategies just a couple of examples to reestablish upper story viability in, in historic buildings downtown, which is a real, it's a challenging task, but something that's really important, especially for a community with the kind of assets, historic assets that Red Wings got. To establish consistently high grade residential neighborhoods surrounding downtown um, and within the older historic districts um, and neighborhoods of the city and to establish what we call market junction, essentially at the, the depot uh, along the riverfront, and to think of this as a catalyst for creating a great community destination, uh, tourism destination, and uh, redevelopment activity that expands out from that zone. And then create this adventure sports hub. Uh, Red Wing continues to grow, and this, was, this plan was done eight years ago continues to become even more of a destination for adventure sports, whether it's uh, rock climbing or kayaking or biking and mountain biking. Um, it's a fantastic destination for all of those uses. So how do you leverage that into the, the commercial district and think about how we take advantage of those natural assets that are around the community? Um, and this is the one that uh, was really important to us as we were looking at uh, the downtown plan uh, that housing units created from 1997 to 2007, <laughs> there were 566 um, developed or created at the community fringes and five <clears throat> created within what we defined as the downtown core. And I think that speaks to a lot of the things that the panelists are going to be discussing tonight. One, how difficult it is to do redevelopment within an already developed area. Um, but also the kinds of uh, demographic shifts and uh, trends that Red Wing is experiencing today um, and how do we incorporate greater housing value, um, the kind of housing that the marketplace is interested in, and how do we think about downtown as serving as the, the platform or the district within which those kinds of things happen. So I think uh, this provides some really interesting insights into both our challenge and our opportunity. With that, I am going to turn it over to Rusty. 
Rusty Fifield. Thanks, Bruce. I always find it curious when uh, pop culture influences things that I want to talk about. And uh, as I was preparing for our comments tonight, I thought about the uh, farmer's insurance commercial. Uh, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. It's kind of what I feel about redevelopment. Over the past 34 years, I've had the privilege of looking at redevelopment from a lot of different angles as a planning consultant, uh, as a financial advisor, uh, working with both public and private clients. So I've got some perspective on, uh, on what it takes to, to do this. I, I like to think that I balance vision with practical reality. Uh, Bruce would tell you that, that they push me to think, work on the vision part of it a little more. Uh, I, I'm, I'm always kind of grounded in how are we going to get that done? What are we going to do? And, and my comments to you this evening will focus on that. Beep. 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 <laughs> I, I have to start off by telling you I love Red Wing. I, this is a this is a great community when I look at it from a redevelopment perspective. Uh, it, it's it's got a genuine charm to it. I've, I I work in suburban communities that are trying to terraform something like this, and you know there's just one Mississippi River, and you've done a great job of embracing it, and the, it's just got the kind of character that I look for in a downtown. You've got wonderful public spaces. I love to come and, and, and wander through your, your parks or, or stand on top of Barn Bluff and take, and take photos. And you can tell that there is pride in this community, that there's been reinvestment, and, and all of those things speak well to the potential of, of, of doing redevelopment going forward. My slide turner left me. God, your help's hard to get. <laughs> So, uh, a great setting helps, but, Is that a beep? Beep. but I have to tell you, redevelopment's complicated, and, and this, is, this is not Red Wing, this happens to be uh, uh, Columbia Heights on another project that I work at, but uh, there are settings that are, that are messy, they're complicated, and they rarely fix themselves up. The, the problem with redevelopment is the scale just doesn't balance. Uh, so on the weighting it down, you've got things like site assembly, and you've got buildings that need to be torn down, and you have polluted sites, and you 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 at times will need structured parking to get the density that's necessary to cause the development to work. And it's hard to tip the scale back the other direction with the revenues that you can get, that the return on the investment that's necessary to leverage private investment and the time and the risk that, that, that redevelopment takes. So what you're working on is trying to find ways to, to, to write that scale to make development practical and feasible and attractive. So, so what do you do? I, as, as Bruce said, there is no silver bullet. There's no magic formula that goes along with this, but there are really important lessons to be learned by what has worked and what hasn't worked in other places, and, and you're gonna hear some of those stories from uh, the panel this evening, and, and you're going to hear some real specific things. Most of my comments are going to be uh, at, at a higher level. I get to be the philosopher of the, uh, the, the group this evening. So uh, one of the things I have learned is that, that, that patience is a tremendous virtue in redevelopment. It does not happen fast. I had the privilege of working uh, so 20, a couple decades ago in St. Louis Park on Excelsior and Green that Sean's going to talk a, a, a bit about, and it, it took years for that wonderful project to, uh, to take place. And I think the worst thing you can do is lose patience. Uh, I have certainly run into places where the frustration builds and, and the decision is to do something, and something is better than doing nothing. And, and what you tend to do is, is simply to create the next redevelopment project for somebody else. You, you do something that, that is out of character, it's not sustainable, and uh, it's, it, you talk about kicking the can down the road, you, you've kicked the development project down the road. It, it, it's, it's critical to have a plan, and whether it's your downtown action plan or some other plan that, that, that grows out of that, but because it takes time, it's necessary to have the baton that you're passing from time to time, from staff that changes and council that changes, 
because it, it's, it's the way to, to steer the right course. It's also a, a tool to communicate with developers. They want to know that you have something in mind about what it is you're going to do, and, and a plan does that. Now having said that, it's also important not to hold on to the plan as though uh, it's, it's the gospel. So it's important to know the qualities that underpin that plan, that, that you have to be flexible to adapt to changing market conditions that, that allow development to occur at the time that it's going to occur, but you also want to make sure that, that you get out of it what's important to the community. As I've talked to people about, the, about implementing redevelopment plans over the years, it's, it, it's not a single event, it, it, it is a series of events so I think it's helpful to think about redevelopment implementation as dominoes. If you've ever done, lined up dominoes to, to fall around in a, in a big circle, it's not, you have to set them up so one knocks over, knocks over the other, knocks over the other. And, and, and I think that's helpful to think about redevelopment implementation in that way. What's the first big thing you can do that leads to the next thing that leads to the next thing? So they are all interrelated and if you can't, if you can't say this domino is going to knock down another one, you need to stop and say, why are you going to do that? So use that as a frame of reference for prioritizing where you're going to go with implementation. It's also important to increase certainty. Uh, redevelopment is inherent with risk. And what you are trying to do is mitigate that risk so that private development can succeed. Uh, so from a from a project administration perspective, don't let the process drag on. Uh, a, a, I've been told consistently by my development friends that a, a quick no is far preferable to a maybe that drags on and on and on to a no. Uh, we have found consistently since the recession that, that pursuit is expensive. It is, it is not cheap to come up with renderings and keep working through a process to try and get through community approval that ultimately doesn't go anywhere. And the more expensive the process becomes, the less likely it is that somebody's going to, 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 to come and do that. It's important for staff and council to be on, on the same page, run into all too many projects where you get a lot of support at the staff level and it goes up to the planning commission of the city council and it, it runs into a, a buzzsaw. So the best thing for complicated projects, trying to, to get the best thing out of it that you can get is to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And from a practical perspective in a redevelopment setting, site assembly is really important. If you're going to, to make an investment up front as a community in redevelopment, uh, assembling sites is important. Uh, we can no longer as municipal governments condemn land for redevelopment anymore. We can debate the merits of that. Uh, the, the, the problem is, is that a lot of redevelopment sites are multiple pieces of property held by multiple property owners, and those have to be put together to get a site that somebody's going to redevelop in a lot of cases. And the, t and the task of doing that left to a private developer is often very daunting. And uh, that's not to say that it can't be done, but if you want to provide a carrot to encourage redevelopment, that one is certainly significant. spend a lot of time talking to public groups and to uh, municipal corporations about investing in private development and, and there's certainly the belief among some that, that financial assistance to private development is a subsidy and certainly there are examples of where that has been. That is not the case in redevelopment. Uh, it, it's an investment because I can tell you with, uh, with a lot of experience that redevelopment uh, uh, of most scales will not occur without public financial assistance. So look at it as an investment. What you are trying to do is offset those costs that put the scales out of, out of whack, and you're doing it so that, that private investment becomes financially feasible. I think it's also important to think about it as a, a, if you're gonna make an investment, what are we gonna get out of it? So it's a, it's a tool to get public benefit. It's not simply giving money to a private party. It's an investment that the municipality will make to get something better. 
do we get better public spaces than we would have had we left it to simply private development and land use controls? Do we get better buildings? Do we get um, a better integration with the surrounding community? Because if you, if you don't invest with it, uh, you're left with land use controls, which rarely get you where you want to uh, with redevelopment. And as you look around at, at, at a lot of the great places, Excelsior and Grand, for example, that public investment has, has led to uh, a much better public setting in it with private development. That said, uh, we've got a really bad toolbox with, uh, with municipal government when it comes to economic development. The last new uh, public finance tool is more than 20 years old and the bulk of the tools that, that communities use date back to the 80s. And they're just not very well suited to the, uh, the struggles uh, and the needs of development in 2017, looking into the future. Uh, the legislature is not inclined to do anything about that. Uh, we, have, we have trouble getting payment for roads, let alone talking about what are we going to do to facilitate uh, cities partnering with developers for uh, economic development. Don't lose track of special legislation. A lot of communities have have said we're not going to try to get general legislative change. Uh, we're, we're simply going to say let's go get legislation that works for our community uh, and, and that certainly is an angle to play. Uh, you are blessed here with having a community that's philanthropic, that you have money to fill gaps here, to do things that other communities can't do and that's a tremendous asset for, for Red Wing when it comes to trying to assemble the pieces to uh, to participate in, in private redevelopment. <clears throat> Related to that, it's a partnership. Uh, it's, it's not just about uh, tr trying to, to regulate development. It's, it's, it's about working with, a, with private investment that wants to come to a community and do good things and trying to figure out how, how you work together. Because uh, you need each other. Uh, they need you, and, 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 and you want them to, to succeed. Working together fosters an understanding of the struggles that the, the, the development's going to face and the, the needs that you have to get something out of this as a, as, a, as a community. Related to that investment is not a subsidy. Understand that profit is not bad. I, I, I've seen too many projects where the community and its consultants try to squeeze every nickel of profit out of the, the project because we certainly wouldn't want the developer to make any more money uh, that, than they had to. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you want that property to succeed. You want that developer to make money, to do a good project, and, and, and to mitigate the, the risk that they're taking in, in coming here where they could be building on a greenfield at the edge of the community or, or in some place else that's a lot easier to, to build on in here. So that whole idea of partnering with, with private development for redevelopment is absolutely essential. And I don't mean to be gloomy. Uh, uh, great things are possible. Uh, you just have to, to work at it and be smart at it. Uh, th this is Excelsior and Grand in, in, in uh, Excelsior and Grand. It's Centennial Lakes in Edina, uh, which is uh, a, a great example of, of what a community can do with redevelopment and public spaces. Unfortunately, it was done at uh, a, a time almost 30 years ago now uh, with financial rules that don't exist anymore, which increases the struggle of trying to duplicate this. Nonetheless, it's a, it's, it's a sterling example of, of things that communities can do with patience and a vision. So, thank you all. Hi everyone, it's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> I thank Brian and, and Bruce for inviting me to participate in this. I just came back to Minnesota after about 15 years away, even though I grew up here and uh, I only met Bruce through a friend of a mutual friend less than three weeks ago, and, he, and here I am. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that level of, of sort of open-mindedness and wonder to the conversation about uh, redevelopment po possibilities here in Red Wing. And 
you know, let me let me just start by I came from a very small town in southern Minnesota, a lot smaller than this, and, and you know, I think um, I've, I've lived in a lot of different places, and river towns are, are absolutely the best towns, and um, I think Red Wing is really, uh, as Minnesota river towns go, is really a star, uh, and so I was excited to be able to come down. I even came here Sunday and wandered around and tried to re-familiarize myself with the, with downtown in the central city a little bit. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, a couple of things and hopefully provide some inspiration, maybe some clarity. Uh, I've also put, included some reference resources that might be useful um, and really try to focus on, you know, redevelopment can seem like a big thing when you're looking about the whole downtown and central central part of, of Red Wing and, and try to break it down and, and encourage thinking about some early catalytic projects that really can change perceptions about what might happen in other places. And you know, there are a couple of big sites and it's hard to go from where you are today to having a clear sense of what to do with a big site. And, and there's real danger in trying to tackle a big site uh, uh, because if it doesn't work right, it, it's really set the entire neighborhood back. And so there are a lot of small sites and a lot of small projects that are easy to do uh, and start to change the conversation. And, and I'm gonna try to talk quite a bit about that in this process. So one of the first things I wanna do and, and sort of commend Red Wing is you've got an abundance of old buildings. And I would encourage the city to really celebrate that abundance. Um, and you'll see a few examples that I'm gonna to point to here. And I don't have a before picture of this building, uh, which is in Seattle, but it's an old industrial single-story building, and it looked horrible, right? Anyone in that neighborhood said, oh, tear that down and build something. Um, and the person who redeveloped this obviously had a vision around placemaking that was different than that, and the belief that those old buildings bring the texture and character into um, the redevelopment process that makes everything around it work better. Um, and so try to think about uh, and talk openly about policies and processes to help save as many of your old buildings as possible. Even the smallest ones can lead to magical things. I think about that tiny little building next to the armory over on Plum Street. The armory is a big, hard project. What are you going to do with that? There's a lot of opportunity um, and, and there's a lot of uh, surface parking around it. It's hard to get your mind around how to solve that whole block there in one move, but that little tiny building could change that conversation. There's virtually no risk in trying to do something creative and interesting in a little building like that and, and bring in an entrepreneurial type of person to develop it or occupy it and, and, and activate the, the buildings around it. So that'd be one thing I'd really highlight. And, and you know, those buildings uh, attract people. That's where young people want to go. This is well documented. They're more walkable neighborhoods. Uh, and, and through that, they add value. I can do this way. Um, I think a couple other points to make really quickly. One is design really matters. And, and when you're talking about redevelopment and you, work and you start to engage various developers in the redevelopment process, if they, don't, if they aren't champions of good design, you don't have the right developers for a redevelopment process. Um, and in saying that, I also want to emphasize, design doesn't mean it's going to be more expensive. Some of these projects I'm going to show you are really cheap projects. They're cheaper than what a standard pro forma developer would just drop on a site. Um, so does good design doesn't inherently mean you're adding cost, but sometimes it means having the ability to bring some resources to bear upstream so that you can invest in design and good designers can engage the community on how to take an old building and turn it into something that people are going to love. Not just like, but love. Um, and, and it matters in a lot of ways. You know, the building materials that you use. Think about all the beautiful brick buildings you have in central downtown. If some developer comes in and uses the wrong materials on a building right next to it, it's going to look horrible. I mean, you can't overstate how big a mistake it is if you don't have thoughtful choices of materials. And you may have building codes and design codes for all that kind of stuff, but if you don't, you know, start thinking about that now. Um, with older buildings, you want to bring light into the interior because it creates wonderful space. Um, and you also want to blur the lines between indoor and outdoor. Uh, and, and part of how you do that is through programming. It's not just having spaces, it's having events and creating a calendar of events at that space so people come 
You know, it's it's think of a of a weekly or bi every other twice a week farmers market. Well, you can have a place that has people doing stuff every day, different kinds of things, and it's attracting people to that area and it's starting to activate that space. The last thing I'll say about that is, in so many development projects, retail is retail spaces are too big, especially if you care about local businesses and independent businesses. Small spaces work for them in ways that um, are, you know, if the spaces are a little bit bigger, are very tough. And there are a lot of great examples we can get into of how the difference between big and small spaces really work. And, and the part of what happens with that is it creates opportunities to celebrate very small businesses growing and growing, outgrowing their space and having to move somewhere. Like that's a win because then you can bring another small one in and you've got, a, you've got two businesses. So it's really important to think about the size of your retail spaces and, and especially if you start to do larger buildings with multiple stories above like four or five stories on top you know there could be a tendency to try to create one retail space for that whole building and you know you're only going to get one tenant and if it ain't the right tenant that'll kill the whole block on the street there'll be no street life because no one will want to come there and so the diversity that you get from small retail spaces is really valuable <coughs> Uh, this is just a resource um, that you can look for. I think a lot of us have heard of the, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, but I will point out they, they have this group called the Preservation Green Lab that really talks about redevelopment and, and taking care of old buildings, not just the, the historic you know, peacocks, uh, you know, glorious old buildings, but all the other old buildings that, that help create character in our communities. And they've done a lot of uh, analysis to help demonstrate the value of preserving old buildings and, and preserving neighborhoods that are populated with old buildings. So this is just a good resource for, for folks to be able to make use of. Um, ugly ducklings often get waved away and people are like, well, that's just gotta be teared, teared down. The, the site has to be cleared and we'll do something completely different. You know, and, and this is an old auto service auto shop, right? It's pretty big, it actually is like a whole pretty good sized block um, and the, the reflex is just wipe that out and have a developer come and drop something in on that whole block um, which could be done but it misses opportunities to do what comes next um, you know and this goes back to um, Bruce's comment about uh, uh, adventure sports and something that's that's really popular here think about um, a building like that it's been transformed into five micro restaurants. Like these restaurants are tiny. And the developer really was like, I want to do something halfway in between a food truck and a restaurant. Because people are outgrowing their food trucks and they want to have a permanent space or they want to add to their business in a food truck. And so he gives them these little spaces. They have shared spaces. None of these individual little micro restaurants has any heating or cooling equipment in them at all. So they don't have those utility costs. The, the building doesn't have those utility costs in the pro forma. They have a shared bathroom, um, you know, many things like that. And, and it's really important to break that down and look at the numbers. And the pro forma for this is online. You can look at all the numbers for this project. Um, but because of the way the developer designed this, because it was a design-led project, and it's very inexpensive, um, he can charge significantly more on a per square foot. Because these little businesses, these little restaurants, are they sitting there going, do I pay $22 a square foot or triple net or am I paying 25? What am I, they, it's like $1,400 a month. On a good Saturday, I'm paying my rent. Like that's the mentality with these little businesses. Um, they don't care that it's $27 a square foot instead of 22. It's $1,400 a month, that's it. No, it doesn't go up, it stays there, and I can make that on a busy Saturday. And then they start to think differently. And, and so they, and you know, this developer goes and does other projects, these guys want to do another project with them. So he's already got tenants lease, you know, coming into his next project because they, they like this. And you know, it's worth noting, you go back, if you, if you think back of the building as it looked before, it's at a big, pretty busy arterial street. There was nothing, no reason to stop. No reason to stop. Uh, he finished that project about five and a half years ago, and now there are multiple housing buildings going up around it. 
Um, there's another um, comparable project you're going to see a couple pictures of about three blocks away. <laughs> Um, and it started to attract a lot of young people who are interested in being a little, you know, they can't afford maybe being in the center of the city, but they can afford just on the edge, uh, and they want to be in a more creative and interesting place. And if you just dropped a big five-story apartment building, there'd be no place for this. No place for this. Um, and there's plenty of lots around that for apartment buildings, as we're seeing. So just some examples there um, of how to use an early project like this that's really achievable here as well to drive perception as to what could happen around it. Um, another resource here from uh, Preservation Green Lab, Strategies for Re Revitalization and Reuse, is sort of a handbook. And I, I just picked out one thing that I wanted to throw on the slide, and we're not going to get into this in any detail, but it's a good time now to start having hard conversations about parking. Uh, as mentioned already, um, almost every city has parking minimums. A lot of people nowadays would say, get rid of your parking minimums because you're building too much parking. Um, and you start thinking about parking maximums, start thinking about shared parking that you already have. And, and you know, I know in the busy fall and summer, you can feel like there's not enough parking, but I bet there's enough parking um, in Red Wing to not have to really worry about a lot of parking. But start thinking about that before the development cycle really kicks in in the central part of town again. Uh, with new projects because otherwise you're going to start spending money and developers are going to start spending money on parking that you may not need. Um, here's a site that anybody on any sort of redevelopment conversation is familiar with. It, it's sort of an odd, oddball, odd shaped site, ugly duckling, nothing, you know, who has any idea what you put there? Um, and if you go to the next side, you put this here. So there are six different businesses, again, micro restaurants, but a couple of other small businesses like a nail salon and a barber, and there's a little bar there. They have a shared space that's indoor and outdoor. So the restaurants themselves have very tiny footprints within the context of the building, but then they have this bigger space that they all share. Um, and they also program events there. So they'll have little concerts and you know, it, it's become a meeting place. As, so you have a, now have a meeting place on a lot like that that everyone used to just drive by as quickly as they could because no one loved that block until that developer came in and said, I can do this. This building is simple, cheap, easy to build. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of clever design and it, you know, almost a little precious in its design, but um, that design didn't cost anything in the context of a building development pro forma. Um, but it makes all the difference in being a place that people want to stop uh, who are driving down that busy street. So you've taken a site that no one cared about and no one paid any attention to, to becoming a destination. And again, that destination will shape what happens around it, not the other way around. Next slide. Um, uh, Rusty talks a little bit about capital already. And, and you know, I think he's, in, in many ways, much more of an expert than I am on capital. But I, it, it's really important to, to plan for your capital needs for downtown redevelopment, uh, especially in a smaller community um, where you're not going to be, you know, receiving all sorts of developers who have, um, you know, all sorts of resources to build whatever they want. Um, it's a great time now to start thinking about capital needs for the placemaking projects and then those that follow after that uh, before you need the money. And, and you know, define what the needs really are. And I know that process is happening. It sounds like there's been quite a bit of work already done. And tailor the capital to fit your needs. Don't simply just borrow what's done somewhere else. There are experts who know how to tailor capital to suit your needs. And you have this blessed situation where you have philanthropic, public, and private capital that can be structured to work together in lots of interesting ways. Um, and again, some of these projects you've seen, the performers are online. You can see where they come. You can see how much they cost. You can see how they work from an operating perspective and as an investment. Um, there's a lot of examples around the country around redevelopment funds that have been created to support various historic town center redevelopments. Um, not so many in the Midwest, uh, but a lot in the East. And so there's a lot of data to borrow from and thinking about how to do that. There's a little bit more information. This is a whole report. And it talks about the kinds of projects they're used for, 
what kind of loan types, acquisition method, methods and models, all of this sort of, there's a ton of data on how these redevelopment funds have been used to leverage private capital, use, thoughtfully use philanthropic capital and public resources to get the most out of uh, uh, redevelopment and including having the resources to do the kinds of projects that save old quirky buildings that add character to your neighborhood. Um, and I'll just end with this. For the Project for Public Spaces has this sort of thing. It, it gets a little busy for my taste, but it, it's like, what are the elements of a great place? Um, oftentimes when you get into redevelopment, you get obsessed with building things. And a great place isn't about the buildings. It's about what the buildings enable to happen. And you know, being mindful of this throughout the process can make a huge difference. And, and I, I just want to talk about a couple of things that I would bring from elsewhere, but then also what I just saw in the last uh, you know few days around Red Wing that I you know I come here and I get really excited about when I see and you know I'm probably the opposite of, of Rusty. People don't ask me to be more visionary; they ask me to be more practical. Um, so uh, I lived in in it's a much bigger city, uh, but it is the biggest small town in the country, which is Portland, Oregon. Um, and it's lauded for all of its, you know, spark growth and things that it does, but it's really has many parts of the, of the city have a very small town feel in the way the blocks are laid out, the kind of buildings they have, and how it works. Um, but um, one of the things, and I'll just bring this up because, again, it's going to play right into the hands of the outdoor sports people who want to come here um, often, but this, this little scrappy bamboo wood product manufacturing <coughs> company, um, that was actually looking not only to use bamboo as a sustainable wood for manufacturing furniture and, and, and for interiors of buildings and so forth, but they actually wanted to move bamboo growing into Oregon as an economic development strategy and connect to farmers. So farmers had another thing that they could grow bamboo for wood. Um, and Scrappy Little Building has a little warehouse, you know, one-story warehouse block on the east side, industrial east side of Portland. And for whatever reason of magical thinking that happened, they, the guy ran into one of these little coffee entrepreneurs who decided he could roast coffee better than anybody else um, and started his little business of roasting coffee in his basement. And, and it, he's really good at it. And the day that they opened, you know, the Portland Monthly is like, this is the best coffee in town, period, full stop. And this is Portland, which is already you know, almost insufferably snobby about coffee. Um, but the only place you could get that coffee was in the showroom of this bamboo wood products company. They just put a little counter in the showroom using his materials and products, showing off what you can do with bamboo, right? Little tiny corner, they split their, they split the revenue and shared costs, you know, pretty open book relationship. But it also became the best co-working place on the east side of Portland. So everybody went there for coffee, and they would sit down and have meetings in the showroom of the bamboo place. And so it became its own little place. And so you still had an industrial activity. They were literally making furniture through on the other side of the wall of the showroom while people were having meetings and doing their work with their little laptops and having coffee every day, every single day. And I tell you, it saved both of those companies because it brought revenue into the building that wouldn't have come otherwise and it helped two businesses that may not have made it on their own to be able to work together to, to actually survive and thrive. Mm -hmm. So I, I just leave you a couple of thoughts just in the little bit of time I've been here. You know, I, just in the sort of central down, side of downtown, you know, there's some big sites, including over by the Caribou Coffee. But I think about early projects, and I'd look east of Plum. <coughs> there's some little sites, and there's a lot of surface parking, and there's some old buildings that look like they're not being used to their fullest where you could do some really early projects. And the other place I would look is down by the brewery, that little stretch of street there. And it looks like things are already starting to happen there, but I would challenge you to not just say, oh, things are already moving there. I would say, get in there and really think about what's the best result there? What's a really great result? Connection to the river and all the you know, outdoor activities that go along with that. There's quite a bit of manufacturing, there's some retail there. Some of that's not gonna stay. So what do you want to do with all those buildings? There are some buildings that look a lot like those ugly ducklings um, that you saw. And you could do some really magical things on that street. And then there's room 
frankly, between that and the highway for some housing. And it's not going to be housing that everybody wants, but it'll be housing young people want. Um, and you know, you could do some really interesting things there as a nice little creative. You know, it could be a creative enterprise zone, so it could always be mixed, live work, small business space, etc. You could do a lot of things there with a, with that kind of a strategy. So anyway, I'll stop because we want to get into the discussion. Cool. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited to be here. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of my job, are meetings like this and the ideas that come from it. Um, it's really exciting to hear Tom's ideas. I can think of three other spots in St. Louis Park that I want to <laughs> employ those. Um, and a lot of my presentation today is gonna to be highlighted around one, perhaps two redevelopment projects, although we've done dozens in the city of St. Louis Park. Um, and they're gonna be a little more on this realm uh, that, that Rusty's been talking about. Um, if you're not familiar with St. Louis Park, we're a western suburb of Minneapolis. Uh, we do have a historic area we, uh, where a streetcar used to arrive. We have a lot of industrial properties that have been turning over to multifamily residential. Um, and we have some areas that have struggled, some aging um, commercial strip areas that have been struggling. That's one of the areas I'm going to talk about today. Um, one of the most important things you can do is a visioning process, and I'm really pleased that you're doing that here. It makes everybody's job easier. It makes it easier for staff to understand the community's values, what they really care about, what things to fight for, and what things they can let slide. It helps the developer determine whether or not he wants to work in that community, uh, and that hopefully you'll attract a developer that meets and shares your values, um, and wants to do the kind of projects that you want to do. Um, I'm going to draw from an example from our first uh, visioning process in St. Louis Park, which was back in 1994. One of the key items that came out of that community uh, process, there were many, but one of them was having a focal point in the community. They were actually trying to build what Red Wing has, so you're already ahead of the game. Um, and this is the kind of effort that it takes to get there, so please do, as Tom said, value what you do have already. Um, so St. Louis Park um, wanted to define its identity, change its identity. Um, they wanted to um, have a place for people to gather and interact and, and, and create community and experiences. Um, the key results from that um, uh, visioning process was having an idea born from the community that was um, shared by all and uh, resulted in really strong political support to make some really tough decisions. So the area, uh, first thing I would do is identify a site. In this case, we identified a site that was near Highway 100 along Excelsior Boulevard, which is a county highway. It was an area of strip bars, uh, not strip bars, <laughs> a strip commercial <laughs> that were bars. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I should have rehearsed that better. Um, and uh, it was an area where we had a lot of police calls. There was a lot of surface parking lots. The, the buildings were not being kept up. Um, uh, there were some single family homes that also were sort of pinched in between an underutilized park area and that commercial strip center. And we had um, kind of a barrier for folks that were coming from the neighborhood to the south into that park. And on the north side of the site was the city's rec center. Um, so it was just, everything was there, but it wasn't working together. Uh, so what I would do is uh, encourage you as you've been doing this to make a plan. Um, there, this is not, the, this is a very difficult part. So um, we, we went through a community design process called a charrette, where we brought in a variety of um, architects, landscape architects, and others that took ideas from the community and then drew them out and created sketches and plans that hopefully showed that. Uh, some of the key elements of that were improvements to the park on the north, a, a, an improved sort of a town green that connected Excelsior Boulevard through the site into, into the park area that had um, a change from being an auto-oriented place to a pedestrian-oriented place, put all the parking into structured parking or below ground parking. Um, could kind of hide that, although it was still there and available. The parking's there for all those businesses. Um, it was hidden. Um, and it also uh, 
uh, made some huge aesthetic improvements along Excelsior Boulevard. So in order to accomplish this, it took a lot of money and a lot of time. This, uh, this process again started in 1994. In 1996, they created a concept plan, and from there they began putting forward the mechanics they thought were needed to really make this project happen. That included a lot of public improvements. We did uh, streetscaping improvements all on Excelsior Boulevard, not just in front of this site, but um, for about a mile east of there, which meant landscaping, uh, lighting, wider sidewalks, safer crossings for pedestrians, all these things. It was a huge investment. We also started putting investment into the park. We had a 300 seat amphitheater that was constructed, a constructed wetland that also provided stormwater treatment for the future um, site. And uh, the city assembled 37 privately owned properties. That was no small feat. Um, at the time we had the threat of condemnation. None of those properties were actually condemned, but there were some property owners that did not want to go, but eventually saw that that was probably the best way to go. Um, um, it also included some acquisition of single-family home properties, which is never easy in any community. Uh, but again, the shared vision really helped uh, the city council make some of those tough decisions. Um, one of the things I would also do, um, so after we had kind of set the stage, assembled the properties, uh, we started shopping this plan around to developers. We went out for a request for qualifications and tried to find a developer to build what the city had wanted to build. And let me tell you that although I think you can see the basic mechanics of the plan are all there, there are a lot of minor, what might be considered minor changes, but many, many revisions to this plan, probably 30 revisions to this plan. Uh, some of the major ones were the town green. The city was really hung up on being a 300 foot wide town green parkway that would go through the site, and the developer said that that would not work. And uh, one of the developers was really convincing. He was actually trying to get them to look at a smaller area. And he just said, you know, we want this to be a people place. You want to be standing on this side of the town green and be able to recognize the face of your neighbor on the other side of that town green. And so it really talked about the intimacy of that space, and it really helped get us over a big hurdle with that developer. Um, we actually went through two developers. We had a developer that we worked with for a year, and we never came to an agreement on and they walked away. And uh, we uh, started up with a smaller firm that was three guys that uh, um, uh, were local, and we had the same vision and passion for the site that we did. Um, eventually, we came to this plan, which was the plan that was approved in 2001. Um, so again, this is since 1994, so it took us about seven years to get to a plan that was actually approved. And then uh, we started construction and in 2001, and the first phase completed in 2003. It was built over five phases. The last phase completed in 2006. So it was a very time-intensive process, um, and uh, uh, has turned out really wonderfully for the community. And that's one thing I would say is we really want to promote the results, try to demonstrate how we've met those requirements, that those things that the community really wanted, a walkable place, a beautiful place, enduring quality materials in the buildings, uh, mixed use, an opportunity to both live and work in the same place, whether you do or you don't, that that opportunity is available. And uh, have a walkable place. This is the highest walk score, if you ever use that, on, I've seen that, in, in the community right here. It's actually raised the, the level of the walk score for our entire community with this one project. And please do celebrate your successes. Um, it's not often that you get all the stars to align to have your vision and, and plan meet with the developer's expectations and find the right market and timing. Uh, we, this project, for instance, could have turned out differently. Uh, in 2001, we were at the peak of the housing market. Um, and uh, the condominium projects wrapped up, the last phase of the condominium project finished up in 2006, and it finished up just before the condo market crashed. Uh, they had sold the second to last unit when that happened. <laughs> and that last unit took two years to sell. But the rest of the project 
uh, <coughs> certainly yeah. saying, and uh, no one except the developer really recognized that that was missing. But the community, in addition to the, you know, the good looking aspects and the public elements outside, also really wanted to make sure that we included some affordable housing in this project. And so there were 18 units in this project that were um, Section 8 project based affordable units. So it's um, been also um, hitting on one of those key elements that uh, our community valued. Okay. Uh, some of the lessons learned, I mentioned the community vision before. We really need to look at it as a public-private partnership with developers. Um, making sure that you're communicating what's important to the community and what you want to get from your participation in this project, but recognizing too that a developer has to succeed as well and to make compromises on the things that aren't sacred. You know, the things that, you know, uh, we've had knock down, drag out arguments about six inches about in between the curb and the building and how much space is really needed. Um, but eventually we, st we step back and we say, what is really important to make this project work? And is six inches really that important? Um, and uh, it also takes a lot of long-term focus. You're going to have to be able to make it through more than one election cycle in your community with this. Um, and um, don't expect the design process to be smooth or linear. Uh, it takes a lot of twists and turns. Um, and you're going to need to um, do a lot of creative thinking, a lot of creative problem solving, and take a team-based approach. That means your staff, your neighborhoods, your developer, and probably a few consultants as well along the way to kind of help you get through this process. Um, and then forming trust and relationships both with the developer and the community, at least in my role, I find that very important um, yeah, because I would like to survive an election cycle as well. <laughs> um, so that's really all I have on the Associate Grand. How am I doing on time? You're good. I think I'd like to talk about one other site just briefly. Really briefly. Uh, very briefly, I'm going to highlight it very quickly. Just might spur some other ideas. It's a smaller scale project. It might relate to some projects or some sites in Red Wing that may be of interest. This was a school redevelopment project. Um, the school had been closed for several years. Um, the uh, school district was interested in selling the property. They were looking to use that money for some um, public, you know, excuse me, some uh, improvements at the elementary school. So there were some capital needs that this could help satisfy. Um, but it was really difficult to think about an institutional use and site that would turn over to private development in the neighborhood, in a single family neighborhood. <coughs> um, and it was tough to balance the interests of, uh, of the school district to maximize their sale of the land and to meet the needs of the community. We did explore, uh, really, to be honest, the city, the, the neighbors said, we want single family houses. <laughs> And it just was not, we, we tried, we did uh, entertain some development proposals uh, for single family houses, it just didn't work. Um, I guess what I would like to say is that going through a design guidelines process with the neighborhood is really important. It really helped us, again, make some decisions, um, knowledgeable about what the, how that was gonna influence people. Um, it helped us to look at multiple scenarios, some that were exactly what the neighborhood wanted, some were exactly what the school district wanted, and we needed to balance those different items. Um, so this particular site, um, the main <laughs> issues for the city or for the neighborhood were that they didn't want anything over three stories tall. That's anything ah. taller really than the existing building. Um, they wanted to have maintain the open space on the right side of the screen along Cedar Lake Road. It really gave a generous kind of green feel for them. Uh, they wanted to improve some accessibility across the site, which they didn't even have now because most of the fields were fenced off and people could look at the green space but not really use the green space. Um, and they wanted to sort of step down the scale of the project if possible toward the west side of, uh, toward the north side, the left side of the screen um, to kind of match with the single family homes that were in the area. Uh, so we looked at these kind of things, we highlighted them in our uh, design guidelines, and we, again, kind of allowed the school district to go and shop their idea and, and market the property, but with these guidelines in hand, so that they could turn away developers that were not anywhere in the ballpark, or at least um, have something very um, practical to respond to. 
And we also did have a proposal for some senior housing on the site to reuse the existing building as well as expand uh, the building. Also, it did not work financially. We did run the numbers on that one. Uh, so it was really disappointing because we would have loved to see that building may remain. But in the end, it was redeveloped. It resulted in uh, two apartment buildings with one underground parking ramp garage that filled the entire, um, underneath both buildings and the main thoroughfare. Um, it, we did save, um, maybe to the next screen, we did save the front town green. It just became part of the stormwater treatment and some sidewalks that passed through and were kind of a shortcut through the site. And then we also, on the north side of the site, were able to maintain a tot lot that is owned and managed by the private property owner, but has equal access to the neighborhood. Um, so it's, uh, you know, again, one of those things that a normal developer would never do that, but when we <coughs> have some tax credit financing money that went into helping with the demolition costs, the structured parking costs, you know, we become a partner at that point and we have an opportunity to negotiate things that are a little out of the ordinary. All right, thank you, Sean. So Bill Beard, unfortunately, had an emergency come up, and he is not going to be able to join us tonight. So we are just going to have to fill in the gaps. Bill was going to talk specifically about downtown-focused housing. Um, maybe one thing I'll mention is that we're talking about this concept or this word, redevelopment. It means so many different things, and it really it's a catch-all phrase for looking at rehabilitation of historic buildings, uh, adaptive reuse of older buildings, um, areas that are transitioning in land use from one use to another and how you think about buildings that, that fit that, as well as creating either new housing or second story housing within a historic district. So it's a, it's a big umbrella that redevelopment kind of covers uh, and there are a lot of topics and subtopics under that wander around the room and uh, hand you the microphone so you can uh, uh, state your question but maybe I'll start with a question we talked about you talked about really a broad range of the kinds of things that are important to redevelopment the broad topic of redevelopment how does a community go from in kind of the broadest sense here to there what if a community Red Wing, if we're thinking about where Red Wing is standing today with wanting to do uh, or encourage more redevelopment, more reinvestment uh, in its downtown core or in the areas adjacent to downtown like Old West Main uh, or other parts of the community, how, where do you begin? We know we have a plan, we have a downtown action plan. Um, the city is actually working on a strategy for Old West Main uh, that's going to be uh, create the basis for that part of the area. But once you have the plan, where do you go? What is what is the next step? One of you has a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, since I probably know almost nothing about what's been happening with the plan, other than that it it, it is happening. Um, you know, I'll just say a couple things and pass it along. You know, one is it's great that the planning horizon goes out a ways, like 2040. So it's it it gives you the freedom to stretch your imagination and think about things differently. But from what I hear in some of the conversation, a big part of this desire is to get some housing in the downtown and central area, which you know I think is is doable. But it's, it's also, I, I think it's also tricky, um, in part because it's, it's going against 50 years of housing trends here, and not just here. Um, uh, and you're also sort of a community, you're close enough to the Twin Cities and you've got a lot of people who come to Red Wing on the weekends, right? And so that sort of invasion of people isn't gonna work for a lot of people to wanna live downtown. But it is going to work for some, and so I think you have to figure out how to get very. It's a terrible word to use because it it's, um, but very granular on what you think that needs to look like and what it is going to be. You know, do you want it? To, do, you know, is it is it for seniors, empty nesters? Is it, you know, young professionals? Is it young adventure, you know, lifestyle folks who might want to move here? because it's too expensive to live in the Twin Cities. 
you know, whatever it is, but get very specific and, and don't commit yourself because I think it's gonna take, as Rusty said many times, it's gonna take a while for the housing piece to start to take shape. And, you know, part of why when I was wandering around on Sunday and thinking about it, I said, you know, do some projects that just start to activate these little pockets of the downtown and central part of the city and just see what happens after that. If you've got some places that really pop, like some of the projects I showed or you know, whatever, you're gonna all of a sudden have a much different conversation around the adjacent properties and what they could look like. Um, and then the only other thing very briefly I'd say about housing is, at the planning level and the policy level, there's always talk about diversity of housing, but then it seems to me that that conversation stops before you actually start developing projects. And so the diversity is kind of stinted you know, you have sort of diversity at the big scale, but in a small scale, you don't have diversity. And that doesn't work very well. Uh, and so, and that's tricky because not a lot of developers are gonna wanna work through the challenges of providing that kind of diversity within a single project or a single site. And, you know, so I think qualifying your developers is a big part of that conversation. If they, if they come to you knowing what they wanna build and they haven't even seen the site, not your developer. If they if they don't if they aren't willing to sit down with you and talk numbers at a conceptual level, not your developer, <laughs> because they want to build what they want to build, and that whole process is corrosive to the community uh, because it's never going to be responsive. Um, and you know, right across the street, you know, I showed you a success story right across the street from that first ugly duckling building where it's now all these little micro restaurants that people go there, you know, from all over the neighborhood and all over town, right across the street was a great opportunity to do a mixed-use housing project, but the developer that got the site had zero interest in the mixed-use project. He just created this ground floor space that no one wanted, you know, and he, he made it just crappy apartments, and, you know, just apartments above, and that ground floor is dead. Nothing is ever gonna go in there. And it could have been a perfect complementary use across the street from what was already going on. But that developer was a pro forma developer. He just wanted to drop a four-story apartment building on, and he had the investors to do that. He had zero interest in what the community around it wanted. You know, it fit within the zoning. So qualifying your developers, I think, is a really important part of that. A um, couple different ideas. One is to break it up into small pieces. Identify something you can do in one year, one thing you can do in three years, and one thing you can do in five years. Um, another thing uh, that you might do in that first year is remove some barriers. If you're identifying things like in your zoning code or something like that that is going to prevent what your community is looking for, get rid of that as quick as you can. Um, and if there's, um, if there's risk, if there's risk of losing something that's important to you, identifying ways to protect that. Um, I think those are probably the top three steps, I would say. Um, I'm struggling to come up with a specific idea for you. Um, maybe I'll take, let Rusty take a shot at it, and if I come up with one, I'll add. Well, I'm gonna build on what uh, both Tom and Sean said, and go back to my comments. Look for that first domino. It, it, what you want is uh, something that can be a success, and I don't know enough about the, the, the plans here, but I know that when I've done redevelopment plans, that's what we're looking for, is something that can be a success, something that leads to something else. Uh, it shows what's possible, it, 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 it leads to the next development that's related to it, you just don't want something that's an investment that's, that's isolated unto it, it itself. And I'm sure there's one of those those here. It's the catalyst project that, that, that Tom talked about. It's something that leads to, to something else. And from a financial perspective, it's a good investment. You're investing something that starts other things to, to grow. And it's really different in other communities. And, and, and you need to understand the context of, of what's here in Red Wing to know what that sort of first domino becomes. Okay, let's take an audience uh, question from the audience. Yes, I'm going to try to be Phil Donahue. <laughs> We're supposed to be talking about housing for Red Wing. Well, Red Wing now has a lot of people working three different jobs to make the income for their family, and these people are saying. There's no place in Red Wing for us to live. 
we can't make the down payment that we need to make to get into an apartment here. Who would like to tackle the issue of affordability and the right type of housing? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at, at, at affordability because it is certainly a problem across the state of Minnesota. Uh, the, 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 the challenge is that to, to build new housing that's affordable costs the same thing it costs pretty much to build in the Twin Cities and you can't turn trains to, to, right. to, to, to make it work. And so <laughs> nothing happens. And it's one of those things that suffers uh, because of the legislative process, that, that you know, ultimately it's something where uh, that public-private partnership needs to exist to help do that. Because you can't, you can't make the construction costs be different than than than, than what they are. Uh, I, I'm sympathetic, and it, it is a huge problem throughout places outside the metropolitan area, and it's gonna it's it's gonna take uh, some broader public policy to deal with that. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a more significant way. I just, I, I just had a couple of points to that. And, you know, I, one is there, I mean, there are some public subsidies to help with low income housing tax credit. And if you did stuff with some of the old buildings, historic tax credits could be part of that as well. And you could, the city could do more to create a, a zone that might bring a little more additional resource to bear. So you can do some things on the cap side of this. I'm going to solve all the problems, right? I think there are several little points I'd throw in the mix to start the conversation. I think one is, you know, there have been periods in history where we've had this, this sort of imbalance between income and what people were earning and the housing stock and what was available. And we should go back to those times in history and look at what was built. Because I think we have this sort of an inherent bias to build what's being built now and keep building more of it. And that's probably not going to work, be, partly because of the cost, but partly because it's frankly it's too big. Um, and a lot of the modern urban housing, some of it's getting too small, right? And so you've got a Goldilocks problem. You got too big, too small, nothing that fits in between. So you know, I think we got to go back and, and think about it at the design side and find architecture really solving creative problems around what kind of housing is going to help people get in. The other thing I would say is we aren't doing enough to get people to get non sort of tax credit housing built that's market affordable, if you've ever heard that term. And I'll tell you about a, a project in Portland that is being developed right now, again, from a site with one of those ugly duckling buildings where it's not being knocked down, but the roof's taken off and it's building up on top of it. But um, this developer did something very creative. He, for another project, he did his own um, crowdfunding equity pro process. He went through the whole process. So he's, and he didn't have to do it. He wanted to do it so he had the tool. He didn't have to do it for that project. It was a $25 million project. He only needed, he only raised 1.5 million. He didn't really need it. He just did it to make the system, make the mousetrap so he could do it in his next project. But his next projects, he wants to do affordable housing without tax credits. And so the way he's doing it is going back to the crowdfunding platform and his other investors and saying, you know, you normally get 8% cash on cash return plus a waterfall. This project, you're not going to get 8%, you're going to get 5%, you're still going to get the waterfall. Um, but we're going to build something that's different. And again, it's not going to work for everybody but you only need one of them to change, start to change the market. And there are a lot of small investors who are having a hard time finding a place to put money, right? So um, because he's reduced the return to the investors, he can internally subsidize the rents. And so in the Portland context, the two bedroom apartment goes from you know, $1,600 to $900, simply because he's made a bet that not the whole market, but some investors are willing to do that because they recognize there's a need for affordable housing and 5% is not so bad, particularly for a small investor who's putting 2,500 bucks in. Um, and you can't get that in a CD or some other thing. So there, you know, that's another way to think about this, but it's tough because you have to solve five problems, right? It's not one problem, it's five problems. 
and it's tough and it's it's going to be really hard um, and there there aren't enough tools and you know Rusty pointed out we don't have tools to do this. Tom, could you talk a little bit about the notion of full cost accounting when it comes to affordability? Expanding sure. the concept of affordability beyond the mortgage or the rent payment? Sure. So, you know, part of affordability is do you have to own a car? Do you have to own two cars? Right? Owning a car is $6,000 a year. Right? Um, and so if you can walk to work, or bike to work if you're not car dependent, that's a, that's a $6,000 raise. Um, and it's a lot cheaper if you don't have to build parking in every single unit that's built, right? So that's one factor. I think the other is, um, and, and this is very early in the process, but you know, very efficient properties reduce utility bills. Utility bills are one of the highest Cost to people who have low incomes trying to live in housing. So you can also you also you also want to make sure that they're very efficient, and the industry knows how to do that. But you have to have a good policy to ensure that that happens. And then the third thing, which is very new, um, and it's in five years there'll be I think a much different way to talk about this. But people recognize that buildings contribute to people's health uh, in a variety of different ways. Good ventilation, indoor air quality eliminating toxics from the building materials, et cetera, helps people live healthier. Also, the design of the building can make people um, feel more active and walk more. They use the stairs, you know, whatever it is. And it contributes to better health. Well, as soon as the healthcare world is connected to the housing world, there's a whole different element of capital that's gonna come to bear. Because it's a lot cheaper to keep people healthy by building healthy housing than it is to deal with sick people. Right. So that's another piece of that. And you know, it's very early, but people are working very hard at that. And you know, it's tough when you see what's going on with all the healthcare, they're just trying to decide whether people can have it or not have it, much less fix the you know, fix the disconnect between healthcare and our housing. Um, I'll just add a couple ideas that we are working on in St. Louis Park. We have not achieved yet St. Louis Park. We have, uh, for the, we've done a lot of development projects, a lot of multifamily housing development projects, and uh, our tax credit financing policy now requires a certain percentage of affordable units within a project if they get city assistance. So either 10% of the units at 50% of the area median income, or 18% of the units at 60% of area median income. Uh, so that's one way. So if you're going to create new housing, you know, make sure that you're including some percentage of affordable. That's not gonna get you out of an affordable housing crunch though. Um, I think we're looking to explore ways to preserve the existing naturally occurring affordable housing, NOAA <laughs> housing, uh, and we're looking at policies that might do that. Um, one other thing that I've been wanting to explore, but it's difficult to do in a community that's so grounded with single family homes, is to start exploring accessory dwelling units um, looking at ways to provide, it, it's a win-win really, it's a win-win It's for the people that want to stay in their home, they have a, another form of income, There provides an affordable housing option that's not available elsewhere, it provides safe housing in good neighborhoods, um, it, it's not going to be a centralized way to resolve that issue. So providing incentives for people to do that. Just one last comment, because I think we need to change the language we're using to talk about this. Uh, historically, we've used affordable housing, and people jump to the conclusion that it's it's low-income people, and, and I don't think that's the issue that we face. We have housing that's not affordable to a whole range of people, and <clears throat> until we start talking in that way, uh, we're, we're going to get hung, hung up to say, we're trying to do more low-income housing. You know, we're trying to make housing more affordable for a whole host of people. Okay. Yes. I have a question. I have more than one, so bear with me. Um, I, I'm just curious, when, with these corporations that come to town, and I don't know how this works with the city, but it seems to me you're paying them $12, $14 an hour, and it, many of them are working two jobs, some of them are working three jobs, and it's very, and plus the housing issue in this town is very, very difficult and strained. It's almost as if you need to have a corporate-private partnership. They bring the, they get this tax benefit for coming in here, 
Maybe some of them have tax break for a number of years. I don't know, yeah. whatever. But they should have some sort of agreement when they come in here based on the fact that they are getting a break of taxes or whatever break they get or whatever incentive draws them here and they have a, re a responsibility towards these incoming employees with this low income base that they're providing that they should be partly responsible for providing some sort of baseline income or support for the city as far as where are these people going to live and it should be a corp some cooperation between the two entities that they support the tax base the corporation does because you can't just start up a nice little business and get a tax break and then bring poor people in here to work these 12 to 14 hour jobs and expect them to live in in a ghetto or a poor house you know um i do health assessments the people at the shoe have a lot of issues with health problems in their families. They're working too much. They're working too hard. And their home situation, I can only imagine, a lot of them don't have good ventilation. They don't provide good, you know, healthy diets. They smoke. They don't get treatment for high blood pressure. I see it. So what I'm saying is that whole cycle needs to be revamped and the whole the whole person needs to be in consideration. When you bring a corporation in here, you are partly responsible for their health and their welfare and their housing. So that's just a thought, okay? That's what I would do, uh, but I'm just nobody. I'm just a regular, ordinary person. You are everybody right now because you have the microphone. I'm going to use that to my advantage. I don't know anything about this river the plan you have. Could you explain that oh, sure. down um, on on the West Old West Main? Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear about that because my husband and I have looked at that area. Oh, great. I think it's an amazing area. Mm -hmm. So much potential. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear what the city's doing. Very briefly, uh, the city and Brian can talk more if you'd like. The city is just kicking off uh, a plan, a future, uh, call it a, a investment strategy for Old West Maine to think about how to uh, propel reinvestment, whether it's through redevelopment or rehabilitation of existing buildings, uh, as well as improving the quality of, of the public spaces uh, along Old West Main and the connection to the river. How did I do, Brian? So, so, and we can talk more about that after the meeting as well. So what would that mean? Like that the, the, the building areas are going to be enhanced, the housing area is changing to what? may not change to anything. Oh, um, I really didn't get an answer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get anything out of that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounded really nice. Oh, good. Yeah, I mean, you know, a regular, ordinary Brian's going to do better than me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know about that, but <laughs> really, I mean, we've had previous planning for the riverfront. Well, in fact, our previous comprehensive plan that our in the process of implementing and a couple big pieces of it are um, you know we have plans for the upper harbor area that generally is recreational in use and you know we all know that uh, we have terrific riverfront park and bay point park and trails and so forth and the city has funding now for a pedestrian bridge to connect old west main street down to the upper harbor area we also are we have capital improvement plan to reconstruct Old West Main Street in those first few blocks from the highway to Jackson Street, is it, Jay? Past Jackson. <laughs> Past Jackson Street, so the first few blocks. Uh, because the utilities are worn out and the, you know, the infrastructure is worn out, so this is an opportunity to, um, where we're putting public investment in and then we, we're working to see if we can um, encourage private development to happen kind of in tandem with it. But you know these are, so we're in the midst of a plan and trying to take this to the next level. Does that help? Oh. <laughs> well there's, there's no exact answer because it's, it's in the future and something that's in, in progress. Yeah. So your, your step one is to construct a road down there that connect, connects to 61 that makes it more accessible? 
Well, and that's, there'll be a whole planning process to talk about what the road should look like and how much emphasis we should put on pedestrian and bicycling and the commercial businesses that are there and uh, what would it take to encourage housing development in the area and, and so forth. But we've got some pieces in place with this pedestrian bridge and uh, the fact that we need to reconstruct the road, you know, it's an opportunity for us to be thinking about those things. <coughs> So it's just all in the planning phases? Right now, it's really in the okay. planning okay. stages. Okay. All right. Who else has a question? Yes. Thank you. I have a question for, I have a question for Tom. Um, while your presentation, you mentioned that um, ugly duckling building situation. Where was that located? Portland. Was that out in Portland where there was no um, cold weather? <laughs> a, couple, a couple of projects in Portland, one in Seattle, but um, you know the weather's not a constraint on that. You know that one building where these little restaurants didn't have heating and cooling. Right. You're not going to do that here. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but you can do a lot to provide a much lower cost format for a small business like a restaurant you know especially a new one right and so like one of the ways to think about that would be you know and I don't I, I think there's a real there may be a real lack of restaurant choices in this center part of town um, certainly there's room for one project like that somewhere um, especially because one of the things that happens when you make the spaces that small and you have a diversity of them if one of them fails it's no big deal right if you create a big one and you get a big you know, fill it up with one tenant and they fail, you've got a big problem, right? If you've got five little ones and one of them doesn't make it, not a big problem. Um, but, you know, I think the, the way that I would describe that is, you know, when that building was done, you know, that was done in 2010 and 11 when the market was horrible. And that developer, you know, they, he couldn't even get a bank to finance his projects because no one had done that before. Well, now these things have been done. And it's a lot easier to get that. And investors have started to see that. So it's not that you couldn't do it and put heating in there. You could still do that, of course. Um, I think one of the advantages in, in a cold climate is you need enough heating that it's worthwhile to invest in a good heating system. Whereas in a place like Portland, you don't need cooling to start with. You never need air conditioning. Um, um, and you don't need that much heating. So. It's hard to justify investing a lot in heating equipment that you barely use. Whereas here, you're going to use it, so it's going to pay for itself. So there, there's a little bit of difference there. But the cost is so much greater than for doing it here in Minnesota. Yeah, but you know, honestly, I would say that I would turn that around and say the land costs here are so low that it's a lot easier to do those projects here. Oh, okay. I mean, even Minneapolis, the land costs are significantly lower than they are in Portland. It's a lot easier to do a project like that in the Twin Cities or anywhere in Minnesota than it is in Portland. And oh. Seattle's even worse. I do want to mention one thing to build on what Tom is saying, and that has to do with this notion of seasonability or seasonality. Um, I've done, uh, I do a lot of work in the Minneapolis park system and have uh, created three restaurant venues uh, within the park system in recent years that are seasonal. And I just mention it because it is an interesting, um, almost test or introductory uh, way of testing the market for a restaurant or some kind of a retail use and think of it as pavilion retail or a seasonal restaurant that operates. Um, and there's a magic to opening something in the spring and having a final day that it's open in the fall. And then the next spring it opens again. People wait, it builds anticipation. There's something to it. So I just want to put that out there. What, what, I, what I took away from that, because uh, I, I, I found those examples really interesting, is it's very much in keeping with the theme of this whole series is innovative ideas. And, and that is, you know, think outside of the box a little bit and, and, and look at what's being done in other parts of the country and not say, well, we can't do something without without heating and cooling, but what was in there that you can transfer here that makes things possible? Uh, you know, you, you, the, the 
banks are saying, we've never, we never done that before, we can't do that. And developers said, well, I've never built that before, let me do the cookie cutter thing that I've done. No, you know, look around and find what the ideas and, and start splicing those ideas together to something that, that, that works here in a different way that, that creates the outcomes that you want, you know, uh, that bring people to, to, to downtown in a way that's, that's more affordable, that's unique, that's interesting. And, and I don't know what those are, but that's what was struck me with those ideas is it's not necessarily just do that, but say, what did I learn from looking at those things that I can apply here? Question. Just yeah. Uh, you know, this is kind of strange. I, mean, I took a tour once in uh, St. Louis Park, and all I remember about it is their public works building had a food shelf in it. Is that, is that am I in the right community, or is that, uh, is that true? Uh, no, it's not, it's not it's accurate. Not, okay. Um, however, <laughs> well, sorry. Right, wrong right next door, we did have we do have some things going on that are um, some nonprofits that are operating out of industrial buildings right next to our public works building, where they're um, shipping out medical supplies and food, um, both locally and internationally. Uh, so that might be tied to it. We do have a, a food shelf in town, though, that does take an innovative approach. They don't just feed people, they also provide consulting services, they try to help them budget, they try to help them where they are, what, you know, help them arrive there, how do we address those issues, not just feed them today. What is HUD's role in this type of development? Because we're talking about housing. It, 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 it really, it, Tom said it depends. I think that's absolutely true. And at this particular point in time, it's hard to know what a federal agency is going to do to, uh, to, to, to play a role in housing or community development or, 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 or anything that's relevant to, to, to your downtown. I, I always encourage people to look to the, what the resources in your community. I think at, at, at this juncture, to look to the state, uh, to look to the federal government, uh, to provide resources, uh, you, you might get there, but I think your time is far better spent doing other things than, than looking for somebody else to, uh, to, to give you some financial help. As I said, the, the one thing I might look for is for the legislature to give you some, some legislative authority to do something different for tools that are, that are local, but the days of, of big federal and state money, are, I think, are long gone. I think, I think that's right. You know, the current issues of, of HUD aside, I mean, they're still largely administering the same tools that have been in place for over 30 years, and, you know, there's not enough, there's not enough to go around, and it's not a great tool. I mean, I think part of part of the housing industry is coming to grips with the fact that you know the tax credit it, it's fine for what it does, but it's not a great tool for solving all the housing issues we have. And and I think just to build on that, the idea of local resources. You know, I talked about the 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 way this this developers approaching investors to take a, a lower return to make market affordable housing. Well, you don't necessarily have to do that in the case here where you've got a philanthropic community that would have an appetite to invest, co-invest with private capital to deliver the similar economics uh, of affordable housing. Like you could do a $10 million project and you know, seven million of that could be market capital and three million of that could be PRI capital from the philanthropic community that's taking you know, one to 2% because of the social benefit and the market capital is at 8% and you're gonna deliver a project that's around six. Um, and you can make rents work better doing that. Um, I think there's more to be done there to sharpen the pencil, but there's a way to start to do that. And I think the biggest thing there is to don't get, don't despair at the total problem. Figure out how to do one project and experiment. Because you can go to any town, any city in America, and they've got the same problem. So there's a need for people to try stuff. And, you know, this could be an opportunity to really do that well. You've got some sites, you've got some old buildings. You've got a philanthropic community and the city engaged in this, so it, it could be done. And, and you may not even need to, 
to get that deep of a subsidy from the philanthropic community if the if there's a way to provide some sort of credit enhancement. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to get creative um, in how that's structured. Um, hello, this, I'm Randall Hammerlin. I'm the executive director of the Housing and Redevelopment Authority, and I'll weigh in a little bit on where I see assistance coming from both the state level and the federal level for housing. And I'll go back to our 2014 housing study. Red Wing was showing that it needed just under 1,100 units. And if you say even at $175,000 a unit, I think I worked out the math, it was $180 million. Yeah. It isn't going to happen through federal or state resources. We must engage the market. The market must do most of our, our, our um, uh, financing in order to meet the needs that we have. However, what we can and maybe can do is what I call leverage. That is, we find ways to bring one dollar to the table to leverage seven or eight or nine or ten dollars. That's how we can make it successful. And a lot of that leverage will be local dollars. It won't necessarily be money from HUD or money from Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Right now, uh, if you were to apply for a low-income housing tax credit project, you're looking at uh, for every four applications they receive, one is funded. And what uh, developers are telling me is that's just too expensive. They're spending sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars to develop an application that doesn't get funded. Well, you take one developer doing three projects that don't get funded for one that does. He just says, "I can't afford to do that because that infrastructure, that money has to come from somewhere. It's just too expensive." So people have lost, I think, some enthusiasm to do tax credit projects, even if the money is might be available for them because they just can't wait that long for it to be funded and it's too expensive. So we must find resources locally and through our market in order to be successful. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, this was for uh, Sean from St. Uh, Louis Park. You talked about the, um, the Excelsior Grand, oh, actually it was the school redevelopment area. And you talked about the diversity of housing there. How did you bring that about? Because you said that there was some low-income housing, there were some condos, or was the, were the condos at the Grand Avenue? Could you just talk about that, and how did you get, get that project? Because what you did is you brought families together, I'm assuming, with um, empty nesters, with um, aging population, which is, we know is one of our largest growing populations in this community. So how did, how did you do that? Because there's so many benefits of bringing all of those people together to, to live in that green space you mentioned. Again, in that uh, Excelsior Grand project, we used um, we used the housing Section 8 housing program. So it was a project-based program. They're obligated to maintain 18 of the units within the development for 25 years um, as affordable. Um, um, and so those individuals pay, uh, I believe it's 30% of their income, whatever that may be. Um, and they're allowed to stay in, in those in those homes. And you're right, it has attracted a wide variety of people to the, the housing in that development. You, those some of those are families because they were some of those are two bedrooms and three bedrooms. Um, we also have a lot of empty nesters, and we also have a lot of millennials. All of them are attracted to a quality site, you know, with great amenities. So um, it has been. I hope that has been influential in those individual lives. Although I don't know them personally. Uh, but to have that safe housing to be, I mean, they feel like they've won the lottery when they do um, uh, move into a, a building like that. I think we have time for one more question. Who has gone? This one there, right here. Hi, my question, um, I'm Evan Brown. Um, my question is for Tom. You mentioned um, a lot of this is around funding sources. You mentioned crowdfunding. I know there's a new program in Minnesota called MinVest to help, you know, kind of small level funders. Can you expand a little bit on that crowdfunding and how that occurred? Because um, I, I, I do, you know, the normal philanthropic um, community can obviously help, but I think there's a huge, you know, ability to tap a, huge, a larger local market of small scale investors. So I'll, um, <clears throat> first off, how many people are, uh, are aware of what crowdfunding is or isn't? Like, do we need a quick 101? Because crowdfunding started as not an equity thing. You just had a project that needed something and, you know, you would offer something in return, not 
financial, right? And, it, and one of my favorite examples of that, in, in, in South Minneapolis, there's a place called Northwood Smokehouse. And this guy, it, I'll be really quick, this guy was, you know, brewing beer in his garage for his pals, right? And they decided they were going to open a little brew pub once the law changed and you could, you know, brew on site and sell and all that kind of stuff. Well, he didn't have the money, and so he did a little crowdfunding thing. He basically said, $1,000 and you get free beer for life <laughs> at the pub. He had $250,000 in 30 days. <laughs> right? That's a lot of free beer. Exactly. Well, how many people can use it? Um, well, and there's more to that story. So he had $250,000 in equity in 30 days. And, it, you know, so he bought the building. He did all the work. It's probably a million-dollar project, right? So, you know, if you figure out the loan to value stuff, all that. You know, but it, it, that was critical for him to do that. Um, and, you know, two things happen. One is you have a thousand shareholders effectively in your project. And so you go to that part of Minneapolis any day at lunchtime, any weeknight in the evening, and that place is always busy. Because you're not going to go there yourself and drink your free beer. You're going to take your pals there. You're going to take your family there, right? That place is always busy, and anything else in that neighborhood is never always busy. So it's a success story in its own right. Well, now you could do it as equity, right? So take that same model and say, $1,000, I'm going to give you, you know, 3%, you know, or you, know, or you could have a dividend structure. You could do whatever you wanted, right? But you make that offering, and people either take it or they don't. Um, and again, part of what you're trying to do is you're trying to unlock opportunities that small investors don't have. And in real estate, it's an interesting opportunity because a lot of individuals just can't get in the real estate market as an investor unless they're taking all the risk by buying rental properties themselves, right? Well, so in this case, the crowdfunding that, that this guy did in Portland for his commercial project, it was a million and a half that he was raising for a $25 million project. He didn't need it, right? He could have built it with equity and debt in the conventional way. But he wanted to build the system so he could do it himself. Because these, you know, MinVest, there's a Fundrise that's a national platform. They're kind of expensive. You know, they tra charge quite a bit in fees to do this on your behalf. So he wanted to go through it. It cost him probably 150000 to go through all the regulatory legal work to do it himself. And he offered minimum $3,000 but he also had a maximum of 25000 And the reason he did that is because he didn't want three people to come in and take it all, right? He wanted it to be a democratic, open to small investors model. And so you could get into that little as $3,000. Again, 8% cash on cash, five-year minimum, that's what you're in for. And so that model could be replicated. And I think there's... There's a tendency when something like that happens that kind of works to just suddenly try to make it big. And I think the, the, the advice would be don't make it big, just do it many times. Because then you're, you're containing risk and pooling, you know, instead of aggregating it all into one giant fund. You, like, you, like the city could say, we're going to facilitate this on behalf of everybody in Red Wing who wants to put, you know, $5,000 in. We're going to guarantee you 2.5%. And, you know, the city could essentially guarantee that and the state might help them. But rather than do one big fund, do many little ones, right? And that allows you to be nimble and try different things in different areas. But you could do that and you know you need 30% equity for a project, right? Roughly. So that's kind of the idea. Really quick related to that, uh, one of the things that the people that sign my paycheck do is underwrite municipal bonds. And uh, one of the things I've always thought about is Crowdfund a, a municipal bond issue, right? Yeah, and instead, instead of to Fidelity Investments, you're selling little pieces of bonds to the community yep. that it with with terms uh, and, and, and an appetite for risk that that the investor in in Pennsylvania really just isn't, isn't interested in. So it's again about thinking about new ideas in in, in a way that, that that fits what it is you want to do, but think think broadly. And, and, and try and find those ideas. We're going to have to leave it at craft beer and crowdsourcing, <laughs> crowdfunding. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our panelists. Thank you guys so much for your time.
we have three questions on the white panels over at the side of the room that we try and ask uh, that the uh, folks with the city of Red Wing try and ask with every one of these innovative um, panel discussions. And I'm wondering if you could take a minute on your way out or discuss uh, as you're talking with folks um, answers to those questions and you can put it on a post-it note and stick it on the board or write it right on the board, whatever is most convenient for you. I think Brian has some uh, announcements as well. Yeah, just real quickly, thanks, thanks everybody for coming. I just want to promote our next session. Our fourth session of Innovative Ideas Series is Happy Healthy Cities, Revitalizing Public Spaces Through Arts, Recreation, and Learning. And it, I think it dovetails real nicely with uh, much of what was, many of the things that were talked about tonight. That's going to happen Wednesday, November 8th. Uh, we've got two sessions of that. It, it'll be uh, here in the foot room. There's kind of a lunch uh, time. Uh, at 11.45 and a uh, evening time at 6.30 be a repeat of the same session. Um, so please come to that. And then also I wanted to mention, <laughs> on your way out there's a handout. Uh, there is a housing summit that's going to take place next week also on Tuesday at 7 o'clock at Mississippi National. Um, I know Randall Hammerlin and others will be involved in really talking locally about uh, our Can I housing. say one thing on that? Yeah, go ahead. And then as our vacancies are in Red Wing, which are near zero percent, and as we have a good uh, economy that we have in Southeast Minnesota, and we do have a good economy, and some of the wages may not be as high as we'd like, but it's a very vibrant economy. What we're finding is that these housing shortage is not just in Red Wing, but it's pushing itself out for the entire county itself, and that's why Goodhue County is having a housing summit because housing is short throughout the entire area and it, it actually goes from southeast corridor all the way down to Winona it's very short housing so it, it's a it's a flip side it's a good problem to have because our economy is so strong but we still have to look at how do we solve this and that's what this summit is about what are the solutions that we can bring to the table and solve this problem so lots of opportunities to talk about the future thanks Bruce